in 2014, archaeologist J.R. Bhagat brought to the world's attention the rock paintings of Charama Jahatisgarh. He argues that they depict a UFO along with a suited and helmeted figure. In these paintings, we see a being with three fingers and a classic alien gray-shaped head and eyes. J.R. Bhagat said, the findings suggest that humans in prehistoric times may have seen or imagined beings from other planets, which still create curiosity among people and researchers. The fan-like antenna and the three legs of the vehicle stand clearly show a similarity to a UFO-type craft. Might our artists and the artists of history be the curators of information which has been ignored, removed, or as in the case of the Bible, translated out of our written texts? In 2009, Irving Finkel got his hands on an amazing piece of prehistory. A unique piece of Babylonian literature inscribed on a 4,000-year-old cuneiform tablet. It speaks to the intricate relationships among ancient texts, Babylonian, Sumerian, and Biblical. It also raises intriguing questions about what other mechanism might carry cultural memory through history. Irving Finkel is one of the world's leading Assyriologists, a co-curator at the British Museum. The tablet was handed to Finkel in 2009 by Douglas Simmons. I knew Douglas from way back as a fan of his character Donut in the British kids TV series The Double Deckers. Douglas actually went on to become a theoretical physicist, but it was through his dad that he came to be the curator of this unique and vital piece of world archaeology. Before the 1800s, little was known about the narrative sources of the Bible's stories of beginnings, and in particular, the Flood. Anthropologists had long noted the presence of Flood narratives in cultures spanning the globe. Then in 1835, Henry Rawlinson of the East India Tea Company lowered a boy over a cliff in western Iraq to uncover the Behistun inscription. The Behistun inscription was a phenomenal find. It was an inscription carved in the side of a cliff in three known scripts, and it was the key to our translating the texts of the cuneiform tablets which we've been digging up since the 1500s. And those tablets, once translated, provided us a window onto long forgotten civilizations. And I'm talking about the cultures that grew out of Sumerian civilization, the Assyrian and the Babylonian cultures. All of a sudden, we learn that the biblical flood narrative is actually the retelling of an even older story, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And when we go to the Epic of Gilgamesh, we find that it's actually the retelling of an even earlier narrative than that. Back in the 21st century, as Irving Finkel studied the Simmons tablet, he noted the extraordinary mathematical accuracy of the building instructions for the Ark itself. The length of rope prescribed did indeed produce a vessel of the exact volume enumerated in the text. Comparisons with the biblical account and with other Babylonian cuneiforms threw up another curious detail. In the story of Utnapishtim, the Ark is a cube, uh, and note this with a volume of 14,400 cubits. In the Simmons Ark tablet, the Ark is a round coracle, but get this, with a volume of 14,400 cubits. In the Bible, we have the instructions for Noah's Ark. Its volume, 15,000 cubits. That's a variance of only 4% across three different cultures, from civilization to civilization, text to text, age to age. That's 
an amazing correlation of information. It shows the dependency of one text on the other, and it shows how precisely information can travel when it's done through writing, through glyphs. But it's actually what happens in our art that I think is even more amazing than that. Go to almost any child's Bible and you'll find an ark that looks like this, or something like this. And yet the text of Genesis tells us in very great detail what Noah's ark actually looked like, a long rectangular barge. This is not a rectangular barge. This is the cross-section not of a cuboid, but of a round coracle, the coracle of Artrahasis. How can an artist have the biblical instructions for that in one hand and produce that image? Clearly what's in the artist's mind has come from somewhere else. Now don't tell me that the artists, the illustrators, knew what they were doing because no one had seen the round coracle of Artrahasis before 2014 when Irving Finkel reconstructed it. No one had even heard of Artrahasis before the 1800s. So by what mechanism did the memory of that shape land in the minds of those artists? Some other mechanism is carrying the memory of that shape from culture to culture, generation to generation. Could it be that the world's art and artists are really the curators of cultural memory in a way we have yet to understand? Could it be that generations of artists and painters and sculptors have been conveying to us information which has been either hidden or removed, or as my book argues, mistranslated out of our canonical texts. In 2003, I took a trip to Lascaux in Dordogne in France to visit what some believe to be the world's most ancient prehistoric cave paintings. The caves were discovered accidentally in 1940 by four kids and a dog, uncovering the work of a culture dated to 17,000 years before present. And today visitors can visit an exact facsimile of those caves and paintings in order to preserve the originals. Immediately I could see that these paintings were not the work of primitive man. They were stylish, they were incredibly skillful, they were witty, they were intelligent, they were beautifully crafted, and really could stand alongside any art from any period. Clearly, this was the work of people who are just as conscious and intelligent and creative as us. I was really surprised by what I saw and baffled to see what I thought looked like a kangaroo in those paintings. So evidently the people who painted these, and they didn't live in the caves, they simply used the caves as the curation place for their art. These people were more conscious, more intelligent, and possibly better traveled than ever I'd anticipated. And if this wasn't their place of habitation, what was it for? Was it art for art's sake? Was it art that was produced in a shamanic state to serve some shamanic purpose? Were its creators using art rather than writing to carry the memory of this time before the last ice age to preserve their cultural memory? That personal encounter with the art of our ancestors at Lascaux in France has made me look at other art from our ancestors with rather greater respect. In Tassili Niger, we can see depictions of figures with spacesuits and helmets and antennae and gloves, along with what appear to be flying saucers. To my mind, that's the most obvious way of interpreting those figures. And just look out for the UFO behind the figure. India, known for its ancient narratives of flying vimanas, holds a wealth of such images. In the Rajatola Caves in the forest of Bari at Badi Tessil in the Ryzen district, Dr. Wasim Khan brings our attention to images that are 4,000 years old 
depicting what appears to be an alien and a wormhole and a UFO, along with various other UFO craft. In 1486, Italian artist Carlo Crivelli produced his painting The Annunciation. You'll note that the way it depicts the supernatural conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary is quite different from the account carried in the canonical texts. When I first saw this painting when I was 18, I actually thought it was a joke. I thought it was a satire, you know, a graffitied classic. Uh, when later I realized, no, this was authentic, I had to consider the possibility, is this actually a message from Carlo Crivelli offering us an alternative narrative of our history? The Summer Triumph Tapestry from Brugge in Belgium was produced in 1538. Now look in the sky. Do you reckon those are flying cardinals hats? Or are they something a little more familiar to the modern eye? Another moment in the story of Jesus Christ is depicted in this painting from 1710, painted by Ert de Gelder, the last pupil of Rembrandt. And you're right, the UFO, if you look up in the picture, or the UAP as we're supposed to call them today, isn't part of the canonical texts concerning the baptism of Jesus, but here it is in the canon of our historic art. Do we believe what we are seeing? Or do our official narratives and canonical texts in the West allow us to look at these pictures but feel the need to explain them away and not believe what we're seeing. It isn't too hard to find examples from all around the world of art that when you look at it, I believe with an open mind, it's not difficult to see ET contact. If you go to the National Museum of Guatemala, it has a whole section devoted to figures wearing space helmets and Bluetooths. Now, because ancient ET contact is not part of our official narratives, I think there's an impulse in a lot of us to look at that and simply not believe what we've seen. We think we live in a visual culture where seeing is believing, but I reckon that if something isn't part of the official narrative or the canonical text, we actually don't believe what we're seeing. And I wonder what would happen if we could flip that, if we could follow the canon of our world art in the same way that we follow the canon of our world's narratives and texts. Would we learn some secrets about ancient ET contact if we followed our artistic canon with a more open eye? Thank you for watching The Fifth Kind TV. Remember to subscribe and click on the bell for notifications so that you never miss when we upload new content. For uncensored access to our full interviews and documentaries, go to fifthkind.tv. For more videos about paleo contact and the wisdom of the world's ancestral narratives, go to the Paul Wallace channel, subscribe and click on the bell. Thank you for watching The Fifth Kind TV.